What is up IF Warriors, it's your boy Edward V and an interesting thing happened. I thought to myself, it just clicked as I was having this conversation with someone and there was somewhat of a back and forth in terms of appealing to authority and that person completely did not understand what that meant. Appealing to authority is simply appealing to what someone is telling you simply because of their position, be it a doctor or a scientist or what have you, depending on what field, just their position alone and going based on what they're telling you without any links or any research or anything to back what they're saying they're simply just saying it and then if you take that as a gold standard or if you take that as the truth then you are just appealing to authority so my rebuttal to that was that no it's more important to look at research especially things like meta-analysis because they can tell you a bigger picture or something that's broader that could incorporate you because it's broader and their rebuttal was well you're just appealing to the authority of the researchers and then that's when I realized that I have to do this video to break down why studies are important and how you can tell the validity of one study over another and why you may see one study say something completely different versus something else I'm gonna go ahead and try to summarize and break all of that down in this video stay tuned Now I know the title of this video is how do I know what intermittent fasting studies are valid but truly the information that I'm going to provide you you can use for any study there are some elements that are unique to the intermittent fasting rhetoric and the debate that's going on but most of what I'm gonna tell you you can apply to any other thing now you're probably wondering to yourself why is it that I see a study say that intermittent fasting doesn't work and then the next month or two or the next week I can see a study say that intermittent fasting does work now I am completely confused what study should I listen to and why does this say that it works and this says that it doesn't and if you don't understand how the system of research and studies work then it can be very very confusing because you can find a contradictory study to every study that exists out there that is 100% easy to do because of so many different factors now I cannot talk about all the factors that come within research and studies and all of that because this video will be hours long I'm going to try to bring it down to a basic level that gives you enough arsenal so that you can have a clear understanding or a better idea of what you're looking at and how it compares to other studies that are talking about the same topics now before I jump into anything one major thing that's very important is where the study is coming from initially so what's the publication that's actually presenting you that study places like the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition the New England England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of Cell Metabolism, the British Journal of Clinical Nutrition, The Lancet. Those are prestigious journals and they tend to use peer-reviewed systems to have those specific studies be published on their website. Now, peer review, let's talk about that because it's important. Anyone can go through an entire process of a study, come up with a conclusion, and it could be intricate, it could be spaced out, set up, everything put together all these different variables used extensive but if it goes through a peer reviewed process and it gets declined that means that it either could not be replicated it wasn't in line with what the evidence suggests it wasn't reliable it didn't have scientific significance enough to be published so what's the peer review process usually up to two people within the same scientific or medical field will review your entire article and give it either a pass or a fail. Usually when it's prestigious publications like the New England Journal of Medicine, what they'll do is they'll have three people of their peers, which is why it's called peer review. So if you're a researcher in regards to aging, they're going to have other researchers that are within that field to review your article. And they can even do it in a double blinded process where they'll actually completely not have the names of who did the 
these studies, it'll just be given to them. They'll review it without knowing who made it, just in case there's any relationship between those researchers. And then that person or three people individually separated who don't know each other will review it and determine that yes, this is a valid piece of scientific evidence and it passes through this peer review system. So if a journal is not peer reviewed, that means that you can do a journal and put it on your own website and say, hey, look, this is a study that I did and you should look at this study because this has a lot of evidence in it. The only problem is it's not peer reviewed. So there could be a lot of bias hidden in there. There could be things that were incorrect in terms of the evidence or what you actually did because they couldn't be replicated. And it's not saying it in there that it can't be replicated, but you don't know. So peer reviewed is super important. And with these prestigious journals, they are definitely peer reviewed, which is why it's better to get studies from prestigious journals than it is to just get them from anywhere on the web, especially from someone's website. Even if they're a doctor, it doesn't matter. That's even more of a bias. If you ask me, it's best to see it on those prestigious journals. Then what you want to look at is the hierarchy or the pyramid of study design, because now the study design is important because although a study can say a conclusion, just because there's a conclusion does not mean that there isn't a plethora of limitations that make that conclusion not particularly applicable to everyone. So what is the uh, hierarchy of study design? Well, at the bottom, you have opinion papers or opinion articles. So if someone just has a theory of something, but they're a doctor or a scientist or what have you, they're in a position of authority in terms of their field and they're talking about something within their field that in and of itself gives it something but it doesn't give it super enormous credibility it just gives you maybe an insight but then you would have to continue to do more research then after that we have animal studies animal studies can give us good information in terms of the fact that you can control so much of that study one thing that's super easy to control just having the animal within the vicinity of the study for the entire time not going away and coming back like you would have with human studies so then at that point you could also control exactly how much they eat the exact amount of calories everything being absolutely exact because you're doing it with animals but it doesn't necessarily mean that the body will translate to humans however because animals are mammals and we're mammals you can take that and set up a platform for further research that does involve humans then from there we move on to cross-sectional studies cross-sectional studies are snapshot studies and they're observational so you're not directly controlling for anything. You're just letting people live their lives. You're using a specific system to figure something out. For example, if running on a treadmill is better than running outside, you wouldn't control for it and have somebody run on a treadmill by your design and have somebody run outside. You would just observe those who like to run on treadmills and observe those who like to run outside and then make a determination within a time frame not further to the future or not further back to the past you just look at it in a snapshot time frame and it's observational so because there's so much disconnect it creates more limitation it doesn't necessarily mean that the outcomes that you're looking for in this cross-sectional study apply the automatic causation so you won't know for sure because it's not controlled the next Next is a cohort study. If the cohort study pulls back, looks at big populations, could look at the entire United States and create a study based off of certain habits if they're looking for a specific element. But of course, there isn't a control there, but it is powerful because of the amount of people that are in that study. It gives you more of a broader picture. So there's a positive to cohorts and then there's a limitation, which is the control of those participants because it's just so vast. But because it's so vast, you might get a more probable snapshot. The next thing on the hierarchy is a randomized control trial or randomized controlled study. This is considered the gold standard by all scientists and researchers. So just by these hierarchies alone, you can see that if someone does a randomized control trial while someone else does a cross-sectional study, but the cross-sectional study says intermittent fasting doesn't work and the randomized control trial says that intermittent fasting does work, put up against each other, it isn't just apples to apples. You can't just say, well, this study says it does and this study says it doesn't. This study, based on the higher 
hierarchy of evidence in terms of research is stronger. So this is a better study than this one. But there is one more step up, which is the final top tier, which is a meta-analysis or a systematic review. The meta-analysis takes all of these studies, but it has to have similar characteristics, then lumps it all together and creates an analysis based off of that. It creates percentages and outcomes based on many studies. And if those many studies contain randomized control trials, which if they do, they usually contain them across the board, then it's the strongest that you can have in terms of evidence within the hierarchy of research and evidence. Now, understanding those things, there are unique things to intermittent fasting that make intermittent fasting have differences in studies. For example, just the term intermittent fasting is a broad umbrella. So because it's a broad umbrella, you can use one method over here and one method over there. And then if someone's saying, well, this method shows it doesn't work and this one shows it does, you have to understand how intermittent fasting actually shines. What's the studies that show that intermittent fasting shines and what are the studies that tend to show that it doesn't shine. Usually when the participants are allowed to eat during their fasted regimen, those studies tend not to shine as much as the studies where the participants do not eat at all during the fasted time frame. So you'll see a lot of 16 ACE studies be very effective, the time restrictive feeding, early time restrictive feeding, the 20 hours of fasting and four hours of eating, you'll see those be effective. The ones you tend to see that have higher failure rates are modified alternate day fasting where you can eat during your fasted time period or 5-2 where you're allowed to eat during your fasted days. Those are the ones that you tend to see elements of it not showing the superiority or anything beneficial to it as opposed to a control which is calorie restriction. Now, I don't think I explained the control in and of itself and how that's important. What does that mean? A control just means that you have an intervention group. Intervention would be, for example, if you want to see if intermittent fasting is better than calorie restriction. Intermittent fasting would be the intervention and the common or conventional system like calorie restriction, which is conventional common, would be the control group and you will put them up against each other. So that's what a control trial is. When it's randomized, you put them into groups that's equal to flipping a coin in terms of selection. So you do not select anyone. This is just random so that there is no bias from that and you can get better information. Sometimes you can even up the ante and do a crossover, which is where you do that intervention and control. You do a washout period and then you flip them and do that same intervention and control, but flipping the groups to get even more accurate data. Also within the studies, you have to look at the methodology, the study design. If someone is in a metabolic chamber, for example, and they cannot leave, and yes, this happens, but they have to be paid handsomely for this as a participant, because what you're asking them to do is not to go back home to their families for a certain amount of time. It could be a month or two months and just getting 100% accurate data in terms of adherence. So if you tell somebody do intermittent fasting, but you allow them to go home, we don't know if they did intermittent fasting. We don't know if they didn't do it, but we know that we told them not to. So we hope that they did not. And hopefully if you have a big group and most of them do it, then you get a better picture, but you don't know for sure. In a metabolic chamber, you know that they're adhering to the diet because they're stuck in there and you're literally the person giving them the exact food. Also sample size matters. If you have seven people versus someone who has 400 people. 400 people is stronger than seven people. This is why you have to start looking at the studies and this is why I explain studies and talk about studies a lot because the study design, the methodology of the study really truly matters. One other quick thing that I want to talk about before I end the video because like I don't want this video to get too crazy is something called statistical significance. So if something is shown to happen, if it doesn't carry a statistical significance and what statistical significance means is doesn't mean that this event is significant in terms of how you think of it as significant it just means that this event is more likely to not have happened by chance it just goes from zero to one zero being there is no way that this happened by chance one being this most definitely just happened by luck by chance if something is 0 0.05 that is considered the threshold for statistical significance significance, the probability value or the p-value. So they do a mathematical process to figure that out. But if they figure out that it is 
0.05, then it is borderline statistically significant. If they see that it is 0.01, then it is statistically significant. And then if they find that it is 0.005, then it is definitely statistically significant. So you have to look at those things too. Is there a p-value of 0.05 or less? If it is, then it is statistically significant, which means that that event, whatever they saw, be it a weight loss or muscle growth or muscle retention or what have you within the groups, they saw it and it did not not happen by chance or it is more than likely not by chance so there you go guys there are so much more things to add to this but I wanted to break down some super important points when it comes to studies so that you understand science is super important and study design is super important and studies are important it isn't just well if you just listen to a study that's also appealing to authority no it is so much more that comes behind a study and if you can't listen to a study there is nothing for you to be able to listen to. Now, are there biases in study? Are there a conflict of interest? Yes, but those things are declared in the study itself. You can see if someone was from a dairy company and they're telling you milk is the best thing in the world based off of this study design. You can look at the limitations of the study design itself and you can see the conflict of interest. But as long as something is peer reviewed, you know that other people within the field that are not directly correlated with that person also looked at the study and passed it. So conflict of interest can be there and there can still be biases that creep in to the study but that's something that you have to look at that you have to determine that other researchers can look at and determine so i hope this helps you with understanding studies i hope it wasn't too crazy i try to literally like make it as simple and a flow as much as i can and hopefully i succeeded with that hopefully this helps you guys and of course as always i want to thank my patrons for my patreon i'm gonna go ahead and put their names right up here And of course, as always, guys, I'll see you on Sunday for another FAQ. Peace!